Okay, <laughs> fabulous to have you all along. Now what I'm going to do, because we've got one microphone between the three, I'm going to get you to have a look at that list of questions over there and pick something that really jumps out at you as your first questions and we'll give you sort of the, about 20 minutes between the three of you to shuffle that across. <laughs> Okay, no hogging the microphone though, so be kind to one another and I'll get out of your way. Yeah, give it the one. Sure. <clears throat> Can you hear me all right? I, I know some familiar faces here and you're probably used to me talking a lot faster than I, I will tonight. So I have a six, I'll, if you can't understand the accent plus the you know, voice, let me know. Um, so I'm here representing uh, City of the Air to a degree work that I do around uh, as the Urban Agriculture Facilitator there, which is a very a very particular job. It's very unique. There are a lot of me, or types of me out in the world uh, doing this work. Um, and my old job is about making urban agriculture easy. Because if you look at facilitation, that's what it's about. We're not solving anything. We're just taking what's in the room and making it easier than what it naturally wants to do. So if I guess if I'm looking at some of these questions around um, uh, around the kind of the council's role, around I see things about accessing space, uh, nature strip, gardening, things along those lines. Um, I think really some of the barriers that you're addressing, and we were talking about this a bit at our table, is that unfortunately council officers are charged with the uh, the welfare of the whole, uh, the welfare of everyone, and that involves a lot of things that aren't necessarily readily apparent to people that uh, are really eager and want to get going in community garden and urban agriculture. Um, and so as a facilitator, I find that my position is often uh, dealing with letting people in on some of those uh, invisible layers that are connected to the places that we often take for granted, our streetscapes, our footpaths, our reserves, our parks, and things along those lines. So some of the biggest barriers we come is actually um, bringing everyone to the table and, and building the literacy around some of those things and actually finding where there's some common ground where we can do some of that work together. Um, there is a lot of uh, willingness and a lot of interest in community garden and urban agriculture and growing food in the private and the public space and the council side of things. Um, it just it really just involves the development of the right kind of relationship. So I feel like I deal in relationships. Um, it's about finding the right information. So uh, barriers uh, around nature strip gardening. A lot of times it's stuff that seems kind of mundane and not that interesting, but it's very, very important to someone that sits at a council. That's things like uh, lines of sight for vehicles and for bike riders and things along those lines. Uh, it has to do with um, you know, accessing for street sweeping and things along those lines. It has to do with planting trees and balancing the different kinds of uses that, that are really out there. You know, not everybody wants a community garden. That's the reality. And so we have to deal with that as a fact. And in the city of Vieira, we've been protested but we're trying to put community gardens into places, and that was a very harsh reality there. Um, so I think that some of the barriers come is really just kind of uh, creating that balance between council and the community. Is um, uh, a lot of times people say, "Well, how can we get more of what you're doing in Yara happening in our in our council in our area?" Um, and the first thing I tell people is, you, you need to get to know the people that work at your council and actually have conversations with them rather than just you know berating them. <laughs> Um, because simply, uh, there are a lot of people that are open to the idea of it. Um, it just texts about, it's just about getting the right kind of conversation. Um, and we're finding some of those key agreements about when a nature strip or a piece of open space can be used for growing food and when it might not necessarily. Uh, and then how do we deal with issues of contamination? Because sitting in the city of Vieira, contamination is huge and the council is responsible for making sure that people don't get sick uh, eating food grown in a public space. Um, and it seems kind of risk averse and things along those lines. Uh, but it actually is moving a lot more quickly than, than people expect. So I think that some of the barriers uh, have to do with you know, creating those relationships, and the best way to overcome them is to simply um, get to know what's actually happening in your council. Read the council plan. That's the first thing you should do. <laughs> uh, you should read your open space strategy. You should read your environment strategy, because it's all listed right there, and that's ultimately what myself as a council officer does. We read our plans that have been approved by our council, and we have to implement them to the best of our ability. Uh, and those are public consultations. So we encourage people build the relationships uh, in a positive way. And when the community or when the council asks for your opinion about open space or environment, just put food in there. Sometimes just the languaging being in there is a revolutionary thing to do, and it's a place to build from there. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question. I could probably go on for a long time, but I'm happy to follow up. Um, I just want to address some of the questions about motivating and engaging people about growing food. Um, 
as I half read my intro, um, a lot of what I did in starting a, a website is that I'm not an expert on growing my own food. Um, but what I wanted to do was inspire others who were starting their journey in growing their own food to give it a go. You know, it's not an all or nothing approach. It's something that you can do um, not only for health benefits, getting out in the garden, uh, the satisfaction of growing your own food, getting kids involved in the education principles, but a lot of the conversations that were going on on the tables I was at was about connecting communities. Now, we talk about community in terms of meeting here tonight, but also in terms of uh, an online community. And I think My Home Harvest is one of the places where people can feel that they uh, are not always faced with, you know, feeling silly for asking a question that a novice might be asking. And most of the people who are on our site are people who are wanting to learn and not really knowing where to start. So in terms of Im improving the, um, I guess, the access to information and providing resources, council and my local council, no, not your council, but ours is also good, um, are actively encouraging guerrilla gardening. You know, they might be just turning a blind eye at the moment, but they're allowing things and just uh, keeping a watchful eye on what's progressing. We have community gardens, but that's not everybody's speak. People might not want to be in a community garden and I just think that there are options out there and we just need to look at the motivations about why you would grow your own food. For some people it's to connect and we were talking about, you know, do we make a difference as an individual? I definitely think we can. There's a, a great article um, recently about the Transition Towns Network and the guy who, Rob Hopkins, who started that has just released a book and he's sort of saying, let's not wait for the cavalry, you are the cavalry, it's not arriving, you know, what can you do as an individual? And, putting together you know, the different elements of small groups and people taking responsibility for their own actions and what that does on a higher level. So we were talking about um, different things related to this in terms of whose responsibility is it? Is it your own responsibility? Is it the responsibility of council? Is it the responsibility of um, your local community garden? Is it the responsibility of SGA to be telling us what we should be doing? Or is it a matter of just trying to find out what motivates other people and what motivates you to want to be involved in the community, is it growing your own food for your own sake, and um, looking at different ways that we can find, um, I guess, making sure that there are those opportunities available. If you do want to connect with the community, you can, but if you want to be someone who just needs the resources, making sure that those resources are found in the right place. It's such a topic, it's amazing, it's hard to bring it down to a couple of minutes, but um, I think I am very interested in the motivation and the, the sustaining interest question. And if we think about it, if the proposition is how would we do this, how would we actually produce more of our food, um, I think a really important thing to remember is the product we're talking about, locally produced, community controlled, potentially not for profit food, is such an amazing product. If you think of the stuff that they'll try and sell us on the TV tonight, a lot of it they've really got to kind of push it uphill to convince us that it's great. But growing more food in urban areas is the ultimate win-win-win. It's good for environment, it's good for water, it's good for biodiversity, it's good for health, it's good for people, um, it's good for building resilience. Like, it is actually, there is no downside to this. I understand the points we've got to negotiate access to public lands, but um, we have such an amazing product. And I think in some ways we are being the community food movement and my experience in recent years has been living in Castle Maine and watching that how, how that um, localisation, relocalisation movement has kind of unfolded. In some ways um, it's like we've been a little bit hesitant to sell the product because it is so good and I think we, that would be my take home message. Remember what we have is fantastic. And the other thing I'd like to think of coming from the other end of things is as a species, this decade, for the first time ever, we are now more than 50% urban. Uh, we've always been people that have lived uh, in close connection to nature. We've always been, if not directly involved in food production then, in very close proximity to it. That is now changing, and I think that we're at a, at a point in our evolution where we need to bring bigger imperatives into the local things we're doing. And I think the task for us is not to retreat to our backyards or even to our community gardens, but to, if you like, you know, put our shoulder to the shovel, but with a really international consciousness. I think that that is really, really important. And I think if we do take that fact, we're more than 50% living in urban areas, more and more food production globally is shifting from agricultural areas into particularly peri-urban areas. And if you look 
here in Melbourne, uh, what's happening in the inner city potentially has jumped ahead of what's happening in the peri-urban, the, the suburban fringes. There is some really excellent stuff out there, but I think there's actually lessons to be learned from communities, even places like Lagos in Nigeria. The food production that occurs around the fringes of that city is absolutely daunting and almost mind-blowing, and that's with almost no transport infrastructure. It's through community infrastructure and private enterprise that gets it from peri-urban areas uh, into the downtown where something like 20 million people live. So I guess that'd be my perspective. One is, we have a great product. I think we perhaps need to get better at selling it as a product. And I don't know if people track how media works, but if anyone's tracked cigarette ads, it used to be, you know, if you, if you stop smoking, you won't get sick. Now the ads say, if you stop smoking, you'll start healing. It's around framing, and I think we could do some work around how we frame the multitude of benefits um, that come with growing our food locally. And it might be community might resonate for someone, Food rock sovereignty might uh, resonate for someone else. Building connections between different people over food, you know, and overcoming xenophobia and building appreciation for tolerance might actually appeal to other people. So we need multiple ways to sell things. And I think more and more we also need to um, deeply understand with what climate science tells us is coming, uh, we really are looking to the imperative of bringing our food production back locally. And all the examples that come from every hurricane that's ever decimated an agricultural area is diverse ecosystems bounce back, and that's true of food production as well as, as ecological kind of balance, always bounce back. They survive better and they bounce back better. And communities with complex localised agriculture are much more likely actually to have resilience in the face of natural disasters. So sell our product, bring the big picture in and plan for long-term change. And remember that what we're doing it, it is a beautiful thing. I was in my garden yesterday feeling guilty because I've kind of been neglecting it quite a bit and it's such a nice thing to do just on a personal scale and my kids were helping me but it's actually an intensely political thing to do as well and I think um, it's really good just to make those connections. Wherever we choose to work for a better world is where we want to put our skills and our, our, our spirit and our, our networks and our, you know, the things we want to bring to bear but we need to see how it fits into the bigger picture. And I think that's really important. So the very humble small things happening in, in suburbs can actually resonate if we have a mind frame that's quite international in perspective. So and I'll just throw something else in there too. This is kind of going off of what Cam said, what it actually said, is that the, the beauty of food is that it's so easy to celebrate. And everyone likes it. Everyone loves to celebrate. It doesn't matter if you speak English or if you don't. If you've been here your entire life or you just showed up yesterday, it brings all cultures together. And that's something that we really look to in, in the work that I do is that everyone enters the garden and becomes the same and they almost always leave happy. And so I think that a lot of times people ask, well, what are the possibilities? What can I do? What can I get going? And for me, it's about just learn how to find simple ways to celebrate it, find simple ways to bring people together like this because then the conversation builds. And my work that I do and everything that's happened at the city of Vieira is 100% driven by the community. It would not have happened if there wasn't a group of people that came together, talked about it, and figured out some ways to leverage some capacity with their neighbors, with their community, and ultimately with their council. Because from that council hat that I'm wearing, it follows that trend. You know, We're always chasing up the community demand and the community interest to the best of the ability. And so I think that the more that can happen in the streets, in the public spaces and food being a topic of conversation, it naturally evolves to what's normal. Uh, and, and that's the real possibility that I'm looking for is normalizing this thing that seems so daunting and so overwhelming and there are some very simple ways to approach it. It just has to be fun if you want everyone to come along. Uh, I, I run a local food swap. I've done so for the last year and a half and I'm now learning things about um, you know, kef water kefir and I'm, I'm making kombucha and different things and preserving foods and bringing some of those old skills which um, I wish I hadn't learned. You know, I've just learned to crochet and I'm, I'm terrible at it. But I wish my mum and my grandmother had taught me these sort of things and we're sort of losing that um, continuity of things and there seems to be this, this gap that we're now filling and we're almost trying to get up to speed with what we should really know and should already be part of our skill set. So I think there are definitely opportunities out there in things such as food swaps and community gardens, in local council, in workshops, in even in corporations. I mean, uh, one of the most amazing things I saw to do with corporations getting involved was a simple swap table. So you had everything and it was after Christmas, so everybody's into regifting. It was basically a surplus of produce, so there was a lot of food, but other people bought things like magazines or different things that they've been given as gifts and chocolates and that. 
and just it was just a share table in a small business and you know what the first thing to go was the produce it was the fresh food and that was so telling in the fact that people do value it and I think that we do need to make sure that people don't feel scared or feel like they don't know where to go to access that sort of simple basic information on how easy it is to grow your own food. So if anything I'd like to change is just giving people those simple set of skills and the confidence to know who to go to, to speak to, to get started. What's the format are you going to ask um, more? What, we're going to um, finish it up there. If you've got any last thoughts. That'll be exciting. Lots of thoughts. Um, so I'm just wondering, so with all the questions that were generated there, were there, were there any that were a surprise to you or that really particularly um, uh, kind of came out of left field for you? They're all things you're thinking about at the moment? No, not necessarily, uh, but there weren't any that completely kind of knocked me over. But what I found from this process was really interesting. At each table I was at, we kind of covered the same issues, but we came from different ways. So the, I think one, the table up the back was very much, what's the technology we're going to use and where do we grow it? One uh, up here was much more around the concept of sovereignty and building community and resilience. So it was just fascinating how we kept coming, covered the same terrain, but our entry point was quite different, and I find that really heartening that we can find that commonality, even though we come, we, if you like, we're walking into the glade from different uh, pathways. The one that, that I think got me um, was the what is the downside, and that's always a tough conversation to have um, because there are some there's some significant barriers, and there's some significant times in which growing food at an urban level doesn't make sense, and I think sometimes. Uh, I have to be the bearer of bad news and, um, and sometimes being practical about things or being realistic about things. And I think that um, that's probably the downside is that a lot of times people come in with a very, uh, they have an idealistic view of how it works somewhere else. Um, and they want that somewhere else to be here now and without really having to talk about, well, what does that look like? And is that right for these, this community? And is this right for this environment, the ecosystem? Um, you know, urban agriculture is, is a product of of a lot of times of, of cities that have, are struggling uh, pretty urban agriculture. You know, you look at Havana, you look at Detroit, you look at places that have suffered massive recessions. You know, Melbourne, it's not a lot of, not a lot of land roaming around for, for large-scale urban agriculture. So a lot of times it's, it's, it's talking about some of those practicalities. But then in that kind of conflict of, well, what is the downside? There's always the edge, which is the opportunity. And I think that's about getting people reframing about, well, what can I do in my community that, that makes sense for the people that live here, that makes sense for me? And it's not something that's going to start really strong, and everyone's going to be really passionate, and then it fizzled out, fizzles out in a month or two and is left as a problem. So how do we actually build that long-term long-term support and long-term investment and integration into a community. And I think the first step in that is what's appropriate? What, what does your community demand? What are you ready to support? Uh, rather than taking an idea off the shelf from someplace like the United States or Canada or Europe and, and transplanting it here, there's so many great examples of how it works in Australia right now. Uh, and a lot of times I tell people, well, you should walk around your neighborhood and I guarantee you'll find all the answers you need in the backyards and the community gardens that already exist. So start harvesting that local knowledge. Uh, and that's the first step to any kind of, uh, to dealing with some of the downsides that come with this conversation. Oh, I was just gonna say, um, the one thing that I find um, so inspiring about being involved in local community events and um, going to see um, community gardens and food shops was being introduced to other members of the community that perhaps um, would not, not otherwise uh, you would meet. And that is often older members of the community who um, are perhaps we hold our uh, event at a community house and that's the only way that they would have found out by us. They don't understand what the internet is. I explain my website and they would be confused. So it's good to be able to encourage different ways to communicate with those people and I do think that it is important to have a mix of um, uh, of people and individuals at different events so that we can share as many skills as possible. So thank you to our panellists. We might um, give your legs a rest and let you sit down again.
reminded of the story I've been amused over the last maybe 15 years or so, watching my dad, who was a farmer all his life, cropping, mixed cropping and sheep um, for wool, uh, who since his retirement about 15 years ago has started gardening, vegetable gardening for the first time ever. And he's having to work out all those things of, sorry, I've got really sticky red clay, what do I do with that? And I had a conversation with him um, on the weekend about raised garden beds and how if you raise it up a bit that might you know, help a little bit. It's just this really funny thing that he's le relearning and learning some whole new techniques, even though he's worked the land all his life. There's always new stuff to learn.